Good afternoon, golf friends, and welcome to a special Tuesday Traces. Tonight's going to be a little bit different because it's Masters Week, and I know all of you want to get back to coverage from Augusta on the Golf Channel. I'm here in Augusta, and it was a beautiful, beautiful day at Augusta National. And to top off an even spectacular day watching golf, I get to have a quick Masters check-in chat with the Mike Bender. Uh, I'm sure all of you guys know but a little bit about Mike Bender. Um, he is the 2009 PGA of America National Teacher of the Year. He is ranked among the top five best teachers by, by Golf Digest. And for more than a decade has been on Golf Mag's top 100 list. He's a legend. We're thrilled he's here and sharing a few minutes of his special week. Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me tonight Thank and happy Masters Week. Yeah, thanks, Mandy. It's great to be here. And it's uh, it's always fun to be in Augusta this time of year. I'll tell you that. It never gets old, that's for sure. It's pretty special to be here this time, too, because it was so weird in November, right? We were just talking about how different it felt. Yeah, with no fans, there was no there were no ropes up on the golf course. Um you know, you had actually had to be quiet. You had to watch where you were walking. I mean, it was very, very strange. And um, and this year, at least the ropes are back. We have, you know, 20% fans, which is, which is, or whatever their percentage is, but it's really nice. It's, uh, it's easy to get around, uh, you know, not to, for, for us as coaches walking outside the ropes on the practice days, it's nice not having to fight the 40,000 people, but, <laughs> but it's, but it, it feels more like a, a normal masters. Yeah, it does. I heard today, um, I was walking around and there was 8,000 people there. And normally on a Tuesday, they expect 30,000. So if that gives you perspective, it was really nice. Uh, but I got to say, it's, you guys love the fans, right? I mean, you would rather the fans be there. Oh, for sure. I mean, I mean, the, the excitement, you know, even in the practice rounds, you know, on 16, when they're skipping balls across the lake and there's roars and you know, I mean, it just, uh, it, it's just a fun atmosphere when the fans are there. And like I said, in November, it was so strange and so quiet out there, nothing happening. You know, it didn't feel like a normal Masters by any means. It's funny to say it's so quiet out there. It's always quiet out there. There's like such a peaceful quiet, but it is fun when you hear the roar around the corner. But, um, you know, everyone tuning in tonight usually hears about technology and, and, and the pressure mat and V1 videos. So we're not going to do any of that tonight, you guys. We're just going to pick Mike's brain. But Mike, tell us, you know, what you did to prepare for Masters. I know you're going to, I mean, hopefully you're using V1 video and the pressure map, but what did you do to prepare for this Masters week? Well, uh, you know, actually this year, uh, normally Zach takes the week off before the Masters and I go up to Sea Island, work with him. We do a lot of work on uneven lies, a lot of tight lie chipping, um, you know, those types of things. But this year he decided to play in the tournament out in Texas. And unfortunately, he missed the cut by a shot. Um, but uh, I was kind of happy in the sense that he got to play the week before. Because sometimes, you know, the, the anticipation of going to the Masters and getting ready and everything sometimes can almost make your you make you try too hard. So I was kind of happy this year that Zach went and played. Um, we're having some great practice days uh, these last few days. It's been really low key, and uh, I, th I feel really good about him and his play heading into the tournament. I'm muting myself as I as you talk, so sorry if it takes me a minute because there's phones ringing in the background. But um, is, do you do you always prepare for Masters differently than any other tournament? Um, I mean, not necessarily from the standpoint of um, it's just like with the Masters, you kind of know that it's a different style of golf because of the way that all the different undulations and the, the different types of shots that you have to hit around here. And you have to get, you really need to be dialed in on your iron play. It's really, I mean, it is a good driving course, but it's primarily a good second shot course and having to control your ball. So yeah, there's some, there's some little bit of different difference in preparation, but um, you know, I always told Zach, I said, Hey Zach, if, if you take a week off before to prepare and that helps you, why wouldn't you take a week off before every turn? You know, so <laughs> the, the key is, is preparing for this type of course, but not making it, you not making it a bigger deal than it is. It's golf and 72 holes and you, you know, you got to play every shot. And so you just get prepared mentally that way. 
Yeah, right. So someone asked a question about, um, they played with Zach and Augusta about two years ago today. Although Zach has been doing well, what are the things you're working on with Zach to get him back to the winner's circle after five years? So I think you sort of already answered that question, Iron Play, and I definitely agree the second shot out there. Holy mackerel. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, you have to put on the right places on the greens, but in Zach's game's trending. You know, he's uh, he's had a pretty good year. He's had three top tens. He's he's starting to get himself in contention in some events. So so basically, it's just kind of putting it all together. You know, he's you know he's got his putter working better. That was one of our goals at the beginning of the year, and he's putting better. I think he's close to the top ten, if not the top ten on tour right now. Um, and so for him, if you know, driving it, he's got to drive it good. He's got to putt good and he's got to wedge it good. If he does those things, you know, he's going to be in contention. So I, I still think at 45, he's got a lot of good golf left. 45 is not that old. Everyone knows I just had a birthday. So whatever. <laughs> um, so someone, Ralph is asking, actually really quick, before I ask Ralph's question, I have a question. Um, in putting, because it's so important, especially here, where do you prefer your weight in your putting stroke? 50-50? Well, I, I, I like players to have more weight on their left side primarily just so there isn't any transfer of weight during the stroke. And so I, I favor, you know, favoring the left side and keeping the weight consistent that way so that they can, you can minimize any lower body motion and uh, you can keep your upper body. Then you can, you know, just have a little bit more of a uh, pure stroke with your shoulders as opposed to having any kind of movement in the lower body. So, yeah, it's kind of I agree. I'm not, well, I don't not agree. Of course I agree. You're the, the legend here. I, someone told me recently, instead of 50, 50 to tick a little weight to my left. And I just felt like that gave me such a more stable tick tock with my shoulders. So anyway, I like it. Okay. So Ralph has a question as well. Let me get back over here. Thank you, Ralph, for joining us. Um, Let's see. Wait, I have a better question really quickly. I, I'll get back to Ralph. Steph, Stefan wants to know, who are your insider picks for contenders on Sunday besides Zach? Wow, that's a good question. There, there is, uh, you know, there's so many, so many great players and they're and playing well right now. It's going to be interesting. What I, what I'm gonna, it's going to be interesting to see how Dustin Johnson does as a defending champion, you know, on different conditions. I don't think this this year you're going to see a 20 under winning the golf tournament. Uh, the course is kind of back to its what it what it plays like normally, which is hard and fast. The greens are uh, on Monday. They were already getting kind of brown and they were getting in their firm. And so it, it's going to be uh, interesting to see what happens, uh, you know, this year in this time of year and getting back to normal conditions and the weather's supposed to be good. They, they were calling for rain on Thursday, but now they've kind of maybe pushed that back to Friday a little bit. So I think it's going to stay pretty dry, which is, you know, actually in favor will help Zach for on our team wise. Anyway, we like it when it's like that. It's a little place a little bit shorter. The greens are rolling so fast. Do you think they'll slow down after rains? Oh, uh, I don't, you know, they, they have such good control out here with the sub air system that they have and, it's amazing how how well they can control this golf course and and the conditions of it. And you know they were just doing some light syringing out there tonight uh, as we got done. And just you know they just know they just have it dialed in. So it'll it'll be uh, kind of in their hands as to how they want the course to play. That's cool. All right. So Ralph asked a cool question. Do you spend a lot of time on swing rhythm and course strategy when you prepare? Wow, for sure. I mean, course strategy is, is so important out here and it really, it really fluctuates hole to hole based on where the pin location is um, as to where you want to leave your tee shots. I mean, a good example is number three, um, the, the short par four. I mean, you, you, can, you can hit driver down there and get it way down there and then, then, or you can lay it back and have a fuller shot in, but with a fuller shot, you're going to put a lot more spin on the ball. So it really depends on where the pin pin location is as to what kind of shot you want to hit off that tee and where you want to leave yourself. So the whole golf course is full of that. And um, it, yeah, that's why it really, to me, um, the guys who have had more experience on the golf course have, have a better chance because they've just learned that over the years and playing it. So, uh, but rhythm, rhythm is a, uh, it's a big thing uh, that we work on. I think it's important in all of golf for all golfers. Um, I think it's so important that on our staff, we actually have a guy that does uh, 
tempo training and he, he builds a track and basically uh, it, it's uh, connected even to your pre-shot routine so that you walk into the ball the same way with the same rhythm and you have the same tempo all the time. And I think um, when players are playing their best and hitting at their best, their, their tempos are very, very consistent. That's really awesome. I love that. Um, did you play, did y'all play a practice round today? 18? Yeah, we, we played nine holes today, played the back nine. And uh, yesterday we played the front nine. So probably tomorrow we'll do the same format. Zach plays late on, on Thursday. So we'll probably go out and play nine, the front nine again tomorrow. Yep. I love watching the practice rounds because they practice all those putts. And it's so fun to watch them, you know, just aim over way over here and it rolls all the way around those greens are crazy it's really fun to watch the the practice rounds on you know tuesday wednesday yeah i mean uh, you know you know when you see it on tv you see the big breaks and everything but when you see it in person it's pretty remarkable and the skills that these players have you know being able to feed the ball down into certain locations of pin placements and so forth and Sometimes it's, it's all you can do to just try to two putt every, you know, you know, so, I mean, I, I remember, I think it was Tiger Woods, one of the, either the first masters he won or whatever. I think he had one three putt for the 72 holes, which is anybody who can go around here without three putting is going to definitely have a chance. It's pretty amazing. Those, uh, those shots. Okay. Steph, uh, Stefan asks, how will the PGA focus on driving distance play out in Augusta this tournament? Well, driving distance, as everyone knows, is 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 if you can if you can hit it in the fairway, it's phenomenal, right? So, uh, but I mean, out here at Augusta, the driving distance is a big deal because of the fact that there's several holes where if you hit it far enough, you can carry bunkers. Good example would be number one. You, if you hit it long enough, you can fly that bunker on number one, so it makes that fairway play a lot wider and. Obviously, having shorter irons in, you can actually put more spin on the ball and control your golf ball a lot more. So it's definitely a golf course that, that favors, you know, the longer hitters as long as they're hitting it in the fairway. Because, you know, you get behind these trees and you have to try to work the ball out of the trees and everything. It's, it, it's pretty hard to hit the greens. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, super important question for my buddy Garth. Pimento or egg salad? Oh, pimento for sure. <laughs> pimento for sure yeah yeah throw the egg salad out so i know i may have put pimento on a barbecue today all in one. Oh I, no it's like totally breaking the rules but i did that um okay what is the key to hitting irons consistently well i mean everything comes down to impact right the delivery of the club into the ball i mean that's you know arguably you could say you know, anybody who's very consistent at golf is delivering the club the same way into the ball. And, um, you know, being able to hit down on your shots and compress the ball, which helps to stabilize the club face and, uh, and controlling that club face uh, is another, another key component to hitting good iron shots. So, um, you know, I try to get, make sure people come in on, on the right plane because that helps to produce more lag and lag helps to get your hands more forward, which in turn, helps you hit down on the ball. So it's kind of a domino effect there, but but definitely got to hit down on the ball and control the club face. Um, okay, this one's funny. The first tee shot might be the most stress stressful in all of golf. Um, how do you coach your players to deal with the nerves? She says, I've heard of tour players who are worried about whiffing the opening shot. I, has Have you ever had like a tour player do that? Like in a no. major tournament? No, never? No, but I will tell you, a funny story, uh, you know, back in the day, and I'm, I'm using Zach a lot just because he's my player who's here this week, but I remember him playing at Muirfield and um, the tee times came out and he said, and he called his wife and he said, hey, Kim, you know, guess who we're playing with? And she said, Tiger Woods. And he goes, no bigger than that. And there was this long silence. And all of a sudden she said, Jack Nicholas. Yes. Yeah. So, so Zach was paired with Jack Nicholas at his own tournament and they had like a 12 o'clock tea time with 10,000 people around the first tee. So anyway, I, I called Zach on Thursday night and said, hey, Zach, how was that opening tee shot? And he said, I was so nervous I couldn't swallow a BB. <laughs> so I said, what'd you do? He said, well, I knew I couldn't pass. I had to play. So he said, I, I visualized great shots I've hit in the past and I ran my routine. 
And I go, how'd you do? He goes, I striped it right down the middle. And then he goes, and I beat him by a shot. And, I, and so I said, well, I, that's no big deal. I mean, he's like 60 years old at that time or whatever. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, everybody gets nervous, but the, but the players, you know, they stick to their routine. They've hit so many great shots under pressure and, and so forth. So, but it is nice to get off to a great start. That's for sure. For sure. Here's a fun one. If you're a golfer who shot an average score of 80 from 6,800 yards, what would that same player shoot at Augusta this week? That's a, that'd be a good question, but I, I would say if he shoots 80, probably, and he, and he played the back tees at Augusta, wouldn't break 100. That's what I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> You have no idea how hard it is, and and uh, and and the amount of putting and chipping. There there'd be a lot of there'd be a lot of uh, four putting and a lot of double triple chips. Oh there. my yeah, my team and I. So we're messaging. We can message each other, and we're all saying I would be at like 120, 110, 130. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. crazy. Um, okay, so we have a question from Dan. He's asking what tendencies you help Zach with in his putting. Um. Uh, Zach, Zach, a lot of what he does in his putting is 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 based on his setup, and uh, sometimes in his setup, if he gets his hands in a particular, he uses a Seymour putter where it's a center shafted putter, so um, he has to have that shaft very neutral at address. And sometimes he gets his hands back a little too much. Sometimes he gets his hands a little bit too much forward, and either case can cause some issues. So we try to we try to really keep his setup really consistent. And if you ever watch him on the practice screen, um, he has a system that we use that, that keeps his setup exactly the same every single time. So we work on that a lot. We make sure that um, we make sure that his stroke is more 60, 40 in length. And, uh, and then basically we do, we do a lot of, we do a lot of speed work and a lot of field, field drills and so forth. Do you do that with all your players, that tempo, always start? That sounds like a routine. That's like you're drilling that in. Everybody starts with a routine, right? Yeah, I think you have to, you know, golf's a game of variables, right? So you have to make as many, thing con as many things constant as you can to become better at golf. But when things are always changing or you're always trying this or trying that, it's very hard to really um, get consistent and build on something. So you have to have a good foundation and, and in putting, the setup is huge. It, it, it's probably as far as the stroke mechanics go. It, it you know I'll put it at ninety percent of the of that comes out of a really really good setup. Um, well, we talk a lot about drills on Tuesday traces, especially drills with the pressure mat. Gary has asked, what one drill would you do to get a consistent downswing? I think he's a Bender Academy member. Gary Henderson, do you know him? Maybe uh, he's asking what one drill you would do to get a consistent downswing. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the downswing is again, the, I, I look at things in like a domino effect, right? One domino falling against the other and they run the list. So let's just say hypothetically that somebody had a really good backswing and all the dominoes were lined up. And then, then the biggest area is in the transition and, so many times I see people with so much tension in their shoulders and their forearms and, and everything that that they really start their downswing more with their upper body and they start they start rotating a little early and that's where they can shift the plane and come in and have all kinds of different release habits and things like that. So if, if, if that's the case, then I have then I, the drills I get people to do is really work on trying to accelerate and be more relaxed in their arms and get their hands moving toward the golf ball. And we do a lot of things we do a fold up drill with an impact bag up against the wall that gets people to do that. Well, I mean, we have probably, you know, a handful of drills that we do to work on that particular aspect of the swing because it is such a big deal. And, um, you know, so it, so it really, it's a hard question to answer, like just have like one answer because it depends on so many other things. Uh, this is a cool one. Are you pleased with the PXG clubs that Zach is swinging and would you recommend them from, for amateurs? I mean, the PXG clubs are, are phenomenal. I mean, they're, they're a great, they're a great club. And, and obviously they've had an evolution that came out and 
and they've gotten, they've continued to get better and better. Um, Zach is dialed in with his equipment now. He really likes it. He really feels confident with it and great. Um, so I think, I think they're an excellent club company. And if you're, you know, but there's so many other, all the companies these days make great clubs. They really do. So the most, one of the most important things is if you set something down, you like the look of it and everything, but the, the fit is the main thing. You've got to get fit properly. And that's going to come from seeing somebody that has a launch monitor that can dial in all your, you know, your specs and your, your, to your swing speed and what your launch angles are and all that. It's really important. And if you do get that fit right, you know, you're all, a lot of clubs are going to work well. And I will say there are some people that use the V1 pressure mat for club fitting as well and seeing different traces with different clubs, which is fascinating. Um, okay, some really quick questions, uh, really fun questions. Do you go for green on three with driver? Who am I? Bryson DeChambeau. I think you do if the pin is in the front of the green and you drive it and you can drive the green or drive it over the green. It's a better, it's a probably an easier way to make birdie um, than trying to hit that little front pin placement over on the left-hand side. If you're Zach, I mean, now he's, uh, he hit driver there as good as he can hit it the other day and he was 30 yards short. So a 30 yards short to a back pin location, pretty good shot to a front pin location, not good. So it it's, uh, depends on how far you can hit it. All right, so then let's see, you go for the back right pin on 12 on Sunday? On number three? 12. Oh, 12. 12. Right pin. Uh, you hit it on uh, number 12, you hit it right over that bunker and you make a 20 footer for birdie or you make par and get out of there. Like they always say, right on number 12, you can't, you, you can't win the tournament there, but you can definitely lose the tournament there. So here's a question about putting the forearm putter anchoring that Bryson's doing. What do you think about that? Do you think the PGA is going to ban that or let him do that? What do you think about the stability of that? Yeah, I don't think, I don't, I think, I don't think they're going to ban that. I think, I think the anchoring part, you know, with a long putter where you're holding it against your body and you have one spot um, where you're anchoring the putter as opposed to having it against your arm. Um, so I, I don't see him outlawing that. And the other thing is, I mean, it's interesting. Matt Kuchar was on the putting green today and um, he normally had the putter anchored to his left arm. Now he's got it on his right arm. So he's actually got a putter with no loft and the putters over on his right arm and he's practicing with that and he's not sure which one, which method he's going to use. So <laughs> it's interesting because if, if it was that great, I think everybody would be doing it or most people would be doing it. You see people change up the, the, the things like that right before masters. That seems a little crazy, doesn't it? Well, I think it's something he's done for a long, he's doing experimenting. I don't think he, it's just something he did, you know, on the, spur of the moment. I think he's been practicing that way. So, you know, but uh, he's obviously a great putter and has been for many years. So I think he could probably put a lot of different ways and still putt good. So here's a fun one for all of us aspiring golfers. How long would you need to hit your drives to be able to compete at a golf? To be able to compete at what? I didn't hear you. At a, to be able to compete at Augusta. Oh, <laughs> I think it's more than just your driver length. Uh, we played yesterday, we played a practice round with Larry Mize. And uh, Larry Mize is 64, I think, maybe 63 years old, something in that area. And to be honest with you, Zach was driving at 30 to 40 yards past him on every hole. But if you remember in November, Larry Mize was on the leaderboard and he, I think, he, I believe he made the cut. Um, and obviously Bernhard Langer's here and he, and he, he's done very well at, at an older age. So without hitting the ball a long way. So it helps dramatically, but I'm telling you the, all the other shots and the so second forth. shot, the yeah. second shot, second <laughs> shot, chipping around the greens, not three putting. I mean, all that kind of stuff is so important. So cool. That's such a cool answer. Thank you for that. <laughs> Okay, here's a club, another club question, if that's okay. If a person is a once a month player, do you like the idea of the same length iron? So the setup and swing to the swing is the same with all the clubs. Um, 
I mean, I think there's some there's some validity to that from the standpoint of consistency. Um, but if you know, the thing I always question is, and if you have a, I mean, I swing a pitching wedge. If I swing a full pitching wedge, the club head speed is whatever it is. And if I swing a full seven iron, it's faster because the club is longer. It's not that I'm putting more energy into it. It's just that well, the, as the club gets longer, the club goes faster. So. I think in terms of distance, I know you can modify the lofts and everything, but most amateur golfers don't produce enough club head speed with the new balls to get them high enough. So there's a there's a law of diminishing return as they get into their mid irons and so forth. All of a sudden now they're, you know, they're not able to get them up as high. They're not able to spin them, you know. So um, I think there's positives and negatives. So that's my politically correct answer on that one. You're, you're so politically correct, Mike, with all of your answers. Yeah. I mean, totally. Um, <laughs> and you're, you're big on that loft thing. I know Cheryl talked about it. You guys do a lot of work on loft and, and where you're hitting chip shots, right? At your academy. Well, we have a, we do a lot with wedges. We have, we have a, there's an optimal launch window that you want to be at for maximum spin when you're hitting distance wedges and controlling your trajectory is, is one of the things that, uh, allows you to be really, really good at distance control. So um, I always use that example of a cannon, you know, at a fort, if it's set at a certain angle and it shoots a cannonball, what determines how far the ball goes is how much gunpowder is in there. And we're the gunpowder. <laughs> we're the ones that produce the energy that makes the ball go. So if we can have a consistent launch angle of the ball, then we can get, we can really dial in our field for distance control. So, um, Unlike somebody who might launch it 30 degrees one time and 26 another, it goes two different distances with the same amount of force. So it's really important to have that, that um, launch window dialed in. I keep forgetting I'm muted. I, I'm curious, have you ever snuck a V1 video on the range at Augusta? Well, I, I, I have, uh, I should show you what I took out there today because they don't want you to have phones, right? They'll take your phone or whatever. So I have my old view or my old camera with a tape in it. And then I, then I videotape and then I bring it home and then I load it into my computer, into my V1. So I can take it back. I can, I can look at Zach's swings from today and, and put them up against, you know, other, other years. I can, um, you know, I got some swings of other players that I can use for teaching purposes and this and that. So, yeah, I, I do a lot of work with V1 out on at Augusta. Oh, we want to see those. We want to see those videos with the pretty background. I oh, love it. So nice. I have, I have a question for you. Do you have a coaching mentor? Who is your mentor? Well, I, I mean, I learned the most from uh, a guy everyone knows, or a lot of people know, a lot of younger people wouldn't know the name, but Mac O'Grady. So Mac O'Grady was my biggest mentor, but I learned from, you know, I learned a lot from a lot of different people, but I had coaches, I had David Ledbetter, I worked with Mike Adams, I, I worked with Ben Doyle and the golfing machine. So I, I had four main coaches, but, but Mac O'Grady's information and, and his mentorship with me changed the course of my whole entire life as far as golf goes. So, um, so his information was based on physics and science. And um, it was just, it, it worked with all the people that he worked with, which was amazing. I mean, some philosophies might help some people and not others, but, but everybody that he worked with their careers and they started winning golf tournaments. And, uh, you know, and I was, I was lucky to be part of that and learn from him. That's pretty cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's really special. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot about that not, one. Not at all, not at all. <laughs> okay, so I know Zach's uh, wearing his green jacket having a meal right now and you guys are playing nine holes tomorrow. What does the rest of the week look like? Well, he's playing Thursday. He plays at 1230 with um, Kevin Na and Gary Woodland. And then, and then he plays the next day at nine, I think 924 or something. So he has really great tee times. Um, so tomorrow again, we'll just go out. We're going to, we're going to practice on the range, do short game pond putting and do some range work until about 12 and then have lunch. And then we're going to go play the front nine and maybe he'll putt a little bit after that. And then he'll be ready to roll for when or for Thursday. So just hopefully we had, we catch some good weather 
and uh, see how we go. Awesome. Well, I have a have a have one of these for Friday, so I'll see you yeah. out there. I hope it's not yeah. raining. So yeah. I'll still be out there with the yeah. umbrella. Yeah, you so better. Yeah, if we all bring our umbrellas, then it won't rain. So that's probably what we need to do. I saw someone by six at the shop today. She walked in and walked out with six umbrellas. I was like, that's a good sign. We're preparing, <laughs> right? We show up unprepared, then it won't be good. Well, thank you so much. I know you have a very busy week. Thank you so much for joining me. The questions were amazing. Thank you for sharing. And uh, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, Mandy, we'll see you out there. Thanks for everybody tuning in. And, um, you know, if they have other questions down the road, just email us or uh, if I can answer them, I'll be happy to do it. Yes, awesome. And you guys, please stay on with me. I'm going to um, talk to another perspective here in a minute. Um, so don't leave yet. Uh, we still have a ton of people that are tuned in and you can send some other questions through to another guest. But Mike, thank you so much. We really appreciate um, your time and have fun out there. Okay. Happy Master's Week. Right. See ya.